But um, and as you mentioned, I'm going to speak about the crested toad. It is a um, critically endangered uh, species. And we've been um, actually working with the crested toad in captivity for uh, going on 40 years uh, next year. So we've had a wide variety of partners um, during the past decades. Um, and these are the partners that are currently working with us that either breed the toads or support the projects um, or provide primary oversight. And, and I especially want to recognize our partners in Puerto Rico uh, because this is a um, multifaceted project with many, many partners and we couldn't do it without everyone's efforts. Um, so we're going to speak about management challenges and solutions for the program. Um, and since we're in the habitat creation and restoration block, I will be speaking about that, but because this has been a, such a long program, I am going to provide a overview of, of pretty much everything, but I'm going to talk really fast, um, hopefully not too fast, um, so that everybody kind of is in the know. So we're going to do a historical overview of the species, talk about our early partnerships and program development, uh, and then go into some of the captive breeding for reintroduction, as well as what our management structures and challenges uh, have been, and then um, go into population management. So the crested toad is a very cryptic uh, fossorial species, and it's the only endemic toad in Puerto Rico. Since its initial description in 1868, uh, less than 50 specimens were ever collected from eight sites in Puerto Rico and one in Virgin Gorda during a 60-year span. And um, from, since the mid-1960s, the toad was believed to be extinct in Puerto Rico. And the last uh, crested toad was observed in Virgin Gorda in 1978. Um, Ernesto Estramera, a school teacher, uh, and Dr. Juan Rivero, professor of herpetology at the University of Puerto Rico in Mayaguez, um, rediscovered population of toads in the northern part of Puerto Rico in 1980, and two pair were actually uh, collected for, uh, or taken to the zoo in Puerto Rico and bred. And those progeny were sent to the Buffalo Zoo in 1981 to begin the captive um, population at the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. And between 1982 and 1989, limited reintroductions occurred in the northern part of the island from those progenies. In 1984, the southern population was rediscovered by Miguel Canales and his co-workers, and uh, the species was then it, it listed as endangered uh, by the Puerto Rican government and became the first amphibian, uh, amphibian species survival program. Uh, for AZA and Bob Johnson um, started that program or was leading that program um, in 1984. 1987 the species became federally listed as threatened and then in 1992 the last northern specimens were observed reducing the known wild populations to one area the southern part of Guanica Forest which we'll talk a little bit about later. Um, and then in 1994 uh, consistent reintroductions began in the south so basically pretty much every year after uh, 1984, we've been um, doing re holding reintroductions. Um, so <clears throat> I think it was, it's important to mention that, that the partnerships were originally fostered for this program and the species um, through research projects that were brought from the Toronto Zoo. And so Toronto um, decided to do a telemetry project looking at um, where the, the, the toads were actually going after they came down for their big breeding events during heavy rains. And it, that was in 1991 and they created this cool little backpack and got a lot of media um, for it. And the DNR uh, participated in those monitoring and research efforts and it really strengthened the relationship with the site manager and uh, Bob Johnson, as well as uh, our partners at Fish and Wildlife Service. Service. And um, Bob hired a lot of graduate students, originally um, brought students down from uh, Canada to work in Guanica, and then later um, students from the University of Puerto Rico also became involved uh, with, with the efforts. So a little, a little bit about the captive population. In 2005, um, Bob retired, stepped down as the coordinator, and I took over. And um, my vice coordinator is Dustin Smith from North Carolina Zoo, and Dustin also manages the stud book for the species. 
And there are currently um, about 1,250 managed uh, crested toads in the United States and Canada. They're housed at 28 facilities, and that includes facilities that just exhibit them. And the crested toads are owned by the Puerto Rican government. They're collectively managed under one Fish and Wildlife Service permit through the Fort Worth Zoo. And then we have an agreement um, with everyone that has houses toads to make sure that they are complying with all of the federal regulations as well as the SSP uh, requirements for reintroduction. So the population is genetically managed through a stud book and um, by PMP 2000 software currently. Uh, assistance provided by the AZA's Population Management Center in Lincoln Park Zoo. And pairing recommendations and breeding schedules are sent out by the coordinator uh, six times per year. And there are currently 19 institutions that participate in breeding and reintroduction efforts for the species. And you can see the figure at the bottom is a population census of the crested toads since uh, it was brought into captivity in 1980. And that blue line indicates the total population. And you can see that the, the toad has done very well for us. And um, we, I think we're on our ninth generation um, now breeding toads. And we could, we could be on um, our 10th, but we have been focusing on breeding some of our wild founders. Um, so um, breeding is not an issue for us generally. Um, exhibit and breeding toads are maintained separately. Uh, the exhibit toads are overrepresented genetically or too old to breed. And once they're moved to exhibit, um, they are never uh, brought back into the breeding population. The toads used for breeding are kept in isolation rooms uh, to reduce risk of spreading novel pathogens to the wild and quarantine standards are um, followed. And health screening for the crested toads occurs at each institution prior to release and throughout the year. And I do send out a schedule of um, what each institution, would, who's going to breed and at what locations, as well as cooling and breeding schedules for each release. It takes us about three months to prepare um, for each release. Um, we, we do estivate the toads for a period of time, so they are cooled down. And then we do use hormones to breed the toads. If they do not breed naturally, we give them a week to try to breed naturally. And if they don't do that, then we do inject them with hormones because we do coordinate uh, the releases. So three to five institutions will breed for each release. Um, and as mentioned, they're timed. Uh, tadpoles are shipped to Puerto Rico via FedEx on the same day. We did used to use commercial airlines, but it became a nightmare to coordinate all those shipments to arrive on the same flight. Um, so now we use FedEx and that seems to be working pretty well for us. And the partners in Puerto Rico pick up the tadpoles and release them at the pre-designated ponds and then continue to monitor them through uh, metamorphosis. So the current distribution of the Puerto Rican crested toads um, we have six reintroduction sites that we're managing. Three are in the northern part of the karst habitat and three are in the southern part. And those are indicated by the large um, orange dots. The smaller yellow dots are the wild um, natural occurring populations that are um, actually part of a meta population. Um, and so for the purposes of this pr presentation, I'm just gonna basically speak about the Tamarindo population. And those sites are managed um, by several different entities. Um, the Puerto Rican government manages three sites, and then we have um, two NGOs that manage um, three and one site respectively. And then two of the wild um, populations are currently on private properties, but they are um, within protected habitat and are overseen by uh, the government um, in, some in, in some aspects. So I'm going to talk about management structure and challenges for our program. Um, species recovery can de take decades, and I think that's kind of going to be something you're going to hear a lot about, um, a reoccurring theme anyway, um, during the next several presentations. Um, in management challenges um, for a multifaceted program uh, with ma multi many partners, um, recovery actions, priorities, um, governing authorities, laws change over time communication between numerous agencies and branches of government is difficult, um, but essential. And a lack of effective communication between stakeholders uh, can actually stall initiatives and fracture partnerships. Uh, management and coordination needs grow as programs expand across all agencies and NGOs, posing communication and training, training challenges. 
and then maintaining consistent prioritization of conservation goals over long term with a dynamic legislative environment is very difficult, but establishing a shared set of goals and priorities is important for success. So what are the keys to successful partner programs? Um, to build lasting partnerships beyond individuals. Um, so transparency is very important. If you don't trust the people or the processes um, that can delay um, progress, engaging stakeholders is very important. We've had a lot of people um, that have remained with us from the beginning of this project, people that have retired, um, that have come back, students that, that used to do um, projects have moved on um, and then returned. And um, so, and they've done that because they've remained engaged in the process. Um, establishing standard operating procedures is important. Defining roles in terms of partnerships. I know in some of the other reintroduction programs that I've been involved in in the past, um, as, as, the part, as the program develops, um, sometimes there's a sense of loss of, of what everybody's roles is and um, it's not always um, apparent what everyone is supposed to be doing and that causes problems. And then identify a core management group um, that actually has authority to implement actions. Originally when this prog program started, it was just a handful of people and not everyone had the authority to actually implement um, the things that we wanted to do or needed to do. And it became very um, dis discouraging. And so um, it's just important to, to involve the people uh, that, that, that are able, able and capable of making decisions and implementing them. And then lastly, a succession plan. And um, because these programs probably are going to take a very long time um, to become successful, it's important to have uh, people lined up to take your positions and, and start bringing them um, with you on trips. Dustin travels with me um, almost every year to Puerto Rico. So he knows all of the players, he knows all of the, and they're familiar with him and they would be comfortable with Dustin taking over the program should something happen to me. Um, and so we also in 2008 decided um, or developed an MOU between the Fish and Wildlife Service and the Department of Natural Resources and the SSP. Um, and that really helped strengthen our relationship and, our, and how we functioned because um, it was oftentimes difficult when um, positions changed um, within uh, one of our, within our, our partner organizations. And it wasn't always a, um, somebody that was highly invested uh, in the project, and so it, it really delayed a lot of our processes. Um, so the primary functions of the MOU uh, explains each of the agency's roles for the direction of the program. It defines primary areas of responsibility and appropriate contacts with authority to implement ac actions. And it, if, and it identifies the position, not the person responsible at each level uh, necessarily. So um, for example, you know, it says that the SSP coordinator will be a member of the executive team. It doesn't say Diane Barber will be a member, but um, that way, if something happens to me, then it's, it's, um, it's easy to, to insert somebody into that role and all of our partners know who they should contact. And then outlines um, preferred forms of communication and means for approval of projects. Some people like to, to communicate via email, others like to talk on the phone or have meetings in person. And then it holds everyone accountable and provides stability for the program when people leave positions or changes in management occur. And one of the most important things that have always occurred with the Puerto Rican Crested Toad um, group is we've had our working group meetings annually um, involving um, all of our stakeholders um, or people interested in the species to come to the meetings to learn about the species and to just have uh, general discussions. And then also it was a forum for all of the site managers um, to, to provide information to everyone as to what was going on at their areas. Also updates from the primary agencies, uh, research updates, students are involved, we can give presentations. Uh, it's, an, it's a place for natural history observations. Again, the toad is very elusive, so any information we can get is always important. Um, a place for us to discuss challenges and set goals for the next year. And then also training, we've brought down um, staff, veterinarians, 
um, from zoos to show our site managers how to um, insert transponders, uh, talk about disease issues, um, and do sort all sorts of training. Um, so it's always been very helpful to have that meeting. Uh, population management, kind of wanted to talk a little bit about um, just the general population of the species as a whole, because I think there's similar challenges that are rev relevant to other species programs. So as I mentioned previously, um, historically the crested toad has um, has only been seen at very few locations within Puerto Rico and from 1868 to 1931 um, it was only found has only been found at, at eight locations in the northern um, part of the island. Two of those are fossil records and the majority of, of them um, of all the sightings have been just one individual specimen collected or a handful of specimens with the exception of the Cabridias and the Guanica sites. Between 1931 and 1966, uh, no toads were found on the island. And then between 1966 and 1992, there were some additional sightings in Isabella uh, and, Como, and Cuomo and Ponce uh, in 1978, but those populations, uh, the toads were never seen after that. And the toads were never found in Isabella um, after 1982. And then of course in 1992, uh, the Cabridias population was thought to be extirpated. And this just kind of gives you an idea of the degradation of habitat that has occurred um, in the northern part of the island, but also kind of around the periphery of the island. Um, there's been historically um, a lot of agricultural um, practices uh, for cattle, sugarcane production, and so um, a lot of the forests, unfortunately, have been denuded. And this is a um, aerial view of Cabridias, where the last uh, northern toads were found. And the images on the right are um, cattle troughs that were um, created in the 1940s. And those are the last remaining um, ponds that the toads were using. And they were found within basically a two mile radius of one another. So they were all part of probably one single um, population. And of course, uh, now the only uh, wild site that remains is in the uh, southern part of the island in Guanaca Forest. And this is a, a photo of the uh, wetland. So to merge or not to merge? Genetic analysis of the wild populations of the northern and the southern toads estimate that they've been separated for over a million years. DNA analysis of the northern and southern populations showed two moderate divergent mitochondrial haplotypes, one fixed in each of the southern and northern populations. So we could tell the, pot, the toads apart, gen, apart genetically, um, but despite that differentiation, uh, the northern and southern groups were no more divergent than any other population of amphibian species. So captive northern and southern uh, toads were managed separately um, because concerns did exist that there may be unknown morphological traits unique to both the northern and southern populations since their habitats varied in vegetation type, moisture, and temperature. The northern captive population originated from four inbred siblings in 1980 and by 2008 was exhibiting signs of inbreeding depression. Most of that was um, low fecundity. By 2011, the northern captive population had a genetic diversity of close to 40% and mean kingship of 0.6 compared to the genetically diverse southern, cap southern captive population with the genetic diversity of closer to 96% and a mean kinship of 0.04. So we began discussions on genetic rescue of the northern population. And in 2011, it was decided to attempt the rescue by um, breeding them with wild collected southern founders. These breedings were successful and the northern southern crosses began and uh, releases began at the three northern sites in 2012 and 2013. The northern cross southern toads in captivity and at reintroduction sites exhibited normal behavior and were surviving in the wild. However, the northern cross southern population was small and the SSP had limited cap capability um, to expand the population to increase northern reintroduction activities. And by 2015, we had to start augmenting the northern populations using southern offspring that we had in our collection 
in addition to the Northern Cross, the crosses. For the next several years, the Crested Toads were managed as two populations, Northern Cross South, or Southern and Southern, but conversations ensued over the need to manage the population as one species. Everyone had agreed that the Northern Cross Southerns and Southern Toads were adapting well in the Northern Wet, West, Northern wet Forests, um, but there were still concerns from a few that there could be some deleterious alleles that might ne negatively impact their ability to survive in the dry scrub forest habitat in the South. After much debate, it was agreed in 2017 to combine the northern and southern populations and manage the crested toad as one species. Um, resources were simply too limited to continue otherwise, and maximization of genetic diversity was key for us. The northern and southern and southern toads are doing well in the north. Two of the southern reintroduction sites are similar to northern habitats, and risk of causing harm to the remaining wild populations was considered minimal, as all reintroduction sites are isolated by geological and man-made barriers that prevent migration. So no of our reintroduced populations can co-mingle with our wild populations. So on to habitat creation and restoration. Considerations, no matter what we're doing, 